30 aircraft delivered, up from 24 in the second quarter, and it had a loss of only $1 million, compared with a $34 million loss in the previous quarter. Also encouraging is the fact that new commercial aircraft orders continue to flow in, 64 more for MD-80s and 23 more for MD-11s. We also had improved performance in missiles, space, and electronics, with especially good earnings from the Delta rocket program related to our first successful commercial launch. The Tomahawk missile, shuttle payload ground operations, and advanced military electronics programs also contributed to improved performance. The other and discontinued operations category is a combination of two line items from our financial statements. We used to report our information system segment separately, but now our plans to sell portions of that business require us to use these categories. On this chart, we have retabulated the second quarter results for comparison purposes. While our overall performance was improved, it is still far from satisfactory. Net earnings of $38 million represent only a 1% margin on our revenue. A leading aerospace company should have a profit margin of at least 5%. To put our performance in perspective, we can look at the profit margins of the major aerospace companies last year. You can see that the top two were both over 6%, and we rank near the bottom of the list with a 2% margin. So 1% in the third quarter this year is nothing to write home about. And look at this. While we ranked second in the industry in sales volume during the third quarter, when it came to the profitability of those sales, we ranked a disappointing sixth. Clearly, we have a long way to go to improve our earnings and the returns to our shareholders, who in large measure are us through our participation in the savings plans and the PASOP. The potential is certainly there. In just three short years since 1986, our backlog of customer orders has doubled from $24 billion to over $50 billion, an all-time high. At the same time, our customer base is shifting. Compared to 1986, the Defense Department no longer dominates our backlog as more of our business becomes commercial. In that three-year period, our DOD backlog has increased less than 50% while our commercial backlog has quadrupled. Over the next three years, that shift will probably continue. Here's how our backlog looks for each of our aerospace companies. The electronic systems company is smallest at $600 million, and the largest by far is $28.3 billion at Douglas Aircraft. With the declining defense spending, it's possible that three or four years from now, about half of our total revenue will come from transport aircraft alone. And because of our tremendous backlog in the commercial transport business, we have growth opportunities that most of our aerospace competitors lack. But with opportunity comes risk. To convert that backlog into market leadership and long-term financial stability, we must change and improve. We must empower and be empowered so that we all can and do contribute to the fullest extent. Next up, a visit to the McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Company in Mesa, Arizona. But first, a word from our sponsor. We had a numerically controlled drilling machine to produce holes. The machine itself was unable to countersink to depth. So we proceeded to engineer a unique depth sensing device. The quality of the holes are much better with what we call a one-shot operation. People with the power to do a better job build a better product. McDonnell Douglas, a company of leaders. A significant event in the third quarter was the delivery in September of the 500th Apache attack helicopter to the U.S. Army. But an even more remarkable story is the fact that in early May, the Apache assembly line was radically changed to simplify the assembly process, to bring workers to the aircraft instead of moving the aircraft to the workers. The idea and initiative for that change came from the people on the Apache assembly line. This is a story about continuous improvement 
involvement, and a leadership style that is changing how they build helicopters in Mesa, Arizona. Impatch is a twin-engine attack helicopter. Uh, it's designed for survivability and designed to uh, mainly as a tank killer to support our ground forces in conventional warfare. It's a four-bladed, fully articulating rotor head, which allows the helicopter to have that kind of maneuverability. The power of the helicopter is awesome. It's got two T-700 uh, turbo shaft motors that put out 1,700 shaft horsepower per engine. When we begin building the Apache, the assembly line was set up on a, on a position concept uh, theory. And it was to move every 1.75 days at maximum rate. And we set it up so that those moves would have to happen. So we could get the discipline established that 1.75 days from day one, this aircraft was going to move. And we set it on the horseshoe configuration so we could put in effect 20 stations in the building. We later discovered all that moving was not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. Some of the problems that we discovered with the original configuration really came from the people on the floor. One thing was they had to shut down their jobs, pack up their tools, take them off the aircraft, move all the support equipment, stands away from the aircraft, and then take the time to move the ships down to the next position, then reset up. It was a lot of time that was wasted. Um, we had to move all the paperwork down with the aircraft. It just it interrupted the whole flow of manufacturing. We had parts carts that were out there, and these carts supposed to move with the aircraft. During the production process, some aircraft were built more than the others, some less through pot shortages, through other problems and rework requirements. So in turn, you ended up with a lot of extra parts out there. Now we became a mini warehouse. And you, and you couldn't find your parts, you couldn't move the carts with the aircraft, no space to store it. So the people had a very difficult time finding their parts to do the job, a lot of time wasted there. As a team leader, uh, I received complaints continuously on, on safety issues where we had overcrowding of the assembly line with the horseshoe. We, we put all these things together when we come out with the continuous improvement process we all sat down and we said we can make this better what can we do and uh, John myself and Vic and a few other folks sat down and just brainstormed the idea and, and we came up with the format we have now. Basically in relation to the old way and the new way that we set up the line when the airframe comes from Teledyne Ryan, it goes into our paint shop for some prep work, cockpit work. And now under the new concept, it comes into a position in the hangar, and we set it there for approximately 20 manufacturing days. Where if you remember under the old system, every two days we'd have to stop work and move the aircraft. Here we physically position it for, for 20 manufacturing days or 10 stations worth of manufacturing work to build the aircraft. So that's one move. Then when it's completed at that point, we move it to a computer area that tests all the wire harnesses on the aircraft. And that spends about a day to two days in that area. When it's completed there, it moves to the other end of the line and sits for all the final phases of manufacturing. So here you've only physically moved the aircraft three times and completed all your manufacturing processes within the final assembly area. After that, it moves on back to your production paint hangar where they do the final painting of the helicopter, stenciling, identifying, and then move it on to our production flight test to move into their phase of getting ready for the first flight. It took us a total of 45 days to implement the change. From the first time we presented it to management, showed them what we were started to do, the program we were working on, and then worked through the phases of it, 45 days later, the plant floor was completely changed around. And I think the pride is, is in what the people feel out there. You got a much less frustrated workforce, they're more happier in what they're doing in their job and how their job is done. They finally feel that somebody listened to them. They've been telling us for years, uh, hey, this is a problem, this is a problem. We haven't been able to facilitate the fix for it. Now we've taken the major burdens off their shoulders and gave them a, a better work environment. Actually, I should say they gave themselves a better work environment. We finally listened and did what the right thing to do. And in turn, we, we, we got a lot of pride out there and an easier program to work with. When we can accelerate the line to 1.6, we should put a lot in the backlog. The biggest problem in, in changing to the new management style is, is the desire and the ability to give up the way things used to be. The way things used to be was I or Vic or Greg was considered to have all the answers. 